the Federal Society for the invitation to speak today. It's a real privilege and for the very warm hospitality that they've shown me. Um, and it is such a privilege to be on a panel with these experts. As was mentioned, I've worked for the International Community of the Red Cross for over a decade. I don't work there now, but I think that's why I have been asked, however, to speak on this panel. Um, I worked for the International Community of the Red Cross at its headquarters in Switzerland and in the field. And my last posting for them was in Washington, and yes, the Swiss organization does consider Washington to be the field. Um, given that background, um, it wouldn't be any surprise to you if I say that there is a need for robust engagement in international matters. Um, the world is getting smaller and smaller, and it's both reasonable and necessary for us to engage. Um, it's an increasingly independent world with a specialized, highly specialized areas, including communications, trade, environment, public health, intellectual property issues, transnational crime, including terrorism. Um, I'm not quite sure where this discussion is going to go. Mm -hmm. However, I would say what I think is important in discussing international law and its role, and the United States' role in it and where international law should go, is to not lose sight of the big picture. That there is a handful of issues that should be looked at critically, but we don't want to lose the rest of the picture that um, when discussing international law, to which we do have benefit. Um, international law is alive and well, even in the, with the United States, and there are um, in our interest in a variety of areas. And just last year, at the 110th, or last year overlapping, the 110th Congress, Senate of, um, provided its advice and consent for over 90 treaties. That was the largest number at any one time in, in history. Um, and there are hundreds of treaties that um, entered into the United States that um, also don't raise much controversy when it happens, like the Sale of Goods Convention or the Child Abduction Convention. And when we start talking about international law and the values and, and transnational norms, it's important, I think, for the discussion to focus on what are these things that we're actually talking about, what are the definitions of these terms, um, and then focus on what really remains challenging. Um, it was already just briefly mentioned, but I will go in to a little bit more detail on an issue I think that's going to be talked about more. Um, and that is the concern raised about customary international law. And customary international law can be unsettling as it's, there's not one oracle proclaiming what it is and by its very nature it's not black letter, it's not written down in a treaty and thus it can seem quite fuzzy. Um, I think it's just important to recall what constitutes customary law and the existence of a rule in customary international law requires the presence of two elements. We need state practice and, importantly, a belief that such practice is required, prohibited or allowed, depending on the nature of the rule, as a matter of law. So this latter requirement of opinion of jurists in establishing the existence of a rule of, of customer international law refers to the legal conviction that the state has to do that particular practice as a matter of right. This is where the sovereign has its voice. And the Supreme Court, our system works to help ensure that these things don't get out of control and it clarify the role of customary law in the Sosa decision uh, related to the alien tort statute um, where the court allowed the judicial recognition of new common law actions but it said with great caution and it required that these new kind of actions would have to be with the same specificity as the crimes um, when the alien tort statute was um, enacted in the in the 1700s, like with piracy, and so it, it ruled in that case that there wasn't enough specificity, so we would not include a new rule on customary law. And the U.S. employs customary law today. I mean, we all heard the announcement today about um, some trials of, of detainees at Guantanamo. Well, in determining who may be detained in the scheme of the law of war, the U.S. has invoked not just international law, obviously, international humanitarian law, or the law of armed conflict, as it's thought often called, but also customary law. Um, it has said it has the right to detain due to, the executive has asserted, the authorization for the use of military force that Congress passed as interpreted through the lens of the law of war. So we are even now using customary international law. Um, the courts will again address the issues as these questions arise, and I think the concern with supranational governments or trans governance um, does raise issues about democratic deficit. It does raise concerns. And our court is, again, even in Medellin, which shocked, I think, the executive because the president thought he could, have, could assert and tell the states what to do. In this recent case, 
um, the Supreme Court said, hey, wait a minute. You know, we want a clear statement from Congress or somewhere in the treaty that it's clearly understood that this was intended, that we're going to delegate authority to an international body. In this case, it was the International Court of Justice. Um, it surprised everyone that this conclusion came down because it's not how the court had ruled on some of the other treaty provisions that use similar language. We're saying that the president couldn't ask the states to do this when the president said, hey, we want you to enforce the ICJ decision. But the court, the Supreme Court was looking at this differently than other treaties. This wasn't just an action where the executive was exercising it. It was the executive actually delegating authority to another body, the International Court of Justice, to make the decision. And the Supreme Court said, hey, wait a minute. You can't delegate. That's not going to happen unless you make a clear statement. Of course, Congress can override. And if the cases of these individuals who are facing the death penalty, um, if Congress decides to enact legislation to, for the U.S. to uphold its um, obligation under the Vienna Convention, then that can go forward. But unless Congress acts, it can't happen. Again, our system of governance taking place. Another area of concern that's often mentioned is soft law. And I've heard some mixed discussion about that, that maybe it's actually good, because there's less treaties, did I understand that correctly? Um, but I think we also have to remember when we discuss soft law as a criticism of international law in general, is that it's not binding law. Let's remember that. I mean, the State Department has 150 lawyers that are continually re um, exercising um, and in international forums to remind what the U.S. is bound to and what it is not bound by. Um, granted, soft law can develop into hard law state science treaties, but it's not binding law. There is a choice between, or the difference between the state's policy choices and what it does is the policy versus, again, turning to what makes or participates to make a good customary law when there's a sense of legal obligation to do it. Um, one other thing I guess I would like to mention, because I think it is partly why I'm here, is the role of non-governmental organizations. And then um, I can after this. Um, there's concern about the roles of non-governmental organizations. Um, my experience with the ICRC and working at um, the UN is that it seemed to me that sovereignty was alive and well, um, that states weren't doing things simply because the NGOs were expressing opinions there. Um, but if there is concern about the role, states can change that. They don't have to let NGOs in to speak. Um, they can take away observer status. For example, the ICRC has formal observer status. But I think we should also recall that non-governmental organizations can provide a certain type of expertise um, that not all of the government representatives there. And I remember representing the ICRC at negotiations on a treaty for enforced disappearances. And since the ICRC has a lot of experience, particularly in wartime, dealing with tracing missing persons, we had a certain amount of expertise on the practical side to offer on what might be the best way to prevent and enforce disappearance. Also, I find it interesting, concern raised by, about non-governmental organizations and the role they play, because one of the concerns about a global governance is that there's a democratic deficit, that we're not representing the people, or these organizations can't and don't. And yes, there are problems with this, that's true. However, here, civil society is having a voice NGOs. Um, so I think that's maybe something we should consider before we take their voices away. And then if we don't think they should be involved or they should be restricted, um, of course it should not just be to like the Amnesty International and the ICRCs, but also perhaps the NRA um, as well. It have to expand the scope of all, um, of all the range of, of NGOs. I think just in conclusion then our remarks, and I'm happy to discuss more because um, there's a lot of focus on, on the United Nations and clearly it's an organ in need of reform. Lots of other global type governance organizations are trying to reform themselves in the realities of the 21st century, like NATO, like the WTO, like the World Bank, um, and are moving that way, and so should the UN, although obviously it's been quite a struggle. Um, we just clearly can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And if the U.S. is not involved with these types of organizations to face the realities of things that cross national boundaries, uh, like SARS, H1N1, or even terrorism, we're going to lose the chance to shape them as well. And recently, um, just this last September, the Constitution Project, where I now work in the American Society of International Law, had a panel together. And John Bellinger there stated that, you know, perhaps there's two extremes. 
Um, these last years in the U.S., there seems to have grown a certain hostility towards international